Welcome back to Discrete Mathematics. Today we're going to take a look at injective, surjective, bijective functions, and then we'll take a look at inverses. So let's get straight into this. One-to-one -one functions, or injective functions, state that if x1 is not equal to x2, then f of x1 should not be equal to f of x2. And of course, um, we take a function from f, or a function f from x to y, so here we have our domain going to the codomain, and I'm going to il illustrate this with uh, diagrams for each one. So what this says is that if x1 is not equal to x2, so for instance x1 and x2 here are different, then we should always get x1 going to a different y value than x2. So this would be acceptable. What wouldn't be acceptable is if x2 also pointed to y1. In fact, if we have this case, then what it means is that this x2 is actually just x1 in disguise. So that's what it means if it's injective. So we'll prove that an equation is injective. And when we have an equation like this, f of x is equal to 3x minus 2, um, before I said that x1 not equal to x2 implies that f of x1 not equal to f of x2. It's easier to prove the contrapositive. So what we can say is that f of x1 is equal to f of x2 implies that x1 is equal to x2. So we're going to show this. So how do we do this? Well, we start off and we say, okay, let's assume f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So what do those functions look like? Well, for f of x1, we're going to get 3 times x1 minus 2 is equal to 3 times x2 minus 2. Okay, so we can bring the 2s over to the other side. So then we're going to get uh, 3x1 is equal to 3x2. Then we can divide both sides by 3, so we get x1 is equal to x2. So we have proven that it is injective, or 1 to 1. So what does this look like graphically with this? So 3x minus 2 probably looks something like this, where this value right here is minus 2. So when we take a look at our x-axis, so let's say we pick this 3 here. It corresponds to this value up here, which would be uh, 7. And when we do this, we notice that if we go to the left or go to the right, there's no other value that goes to the exact same y value. So there's no other x we can choose that gives us the same y. 3 is the only value that's going to give us f of x is equal to 7. So that is a proof that 3x minus 2 is injective. So let's take a look at another equation. f of x equals x squared. So let's take a look here. f of x1 is equal to f of x2. Start out with that. So this means that x1 squared is equal to x2 squared. Okay, so let's take the square root of both sides. Well, that means that plus or minus x1 is going to be equal to plus or minus x2. So here's the question. Does x1 equal x2? And the answer is going to be no. Why? Because, well, plus or minus x1, that means that positive x1 can be equal to negative x2. So, for example, that's like saying that 3 is equal to negative 3, and that's clearly not good. That's not right for an injective function. So, it is not injective. In fact, when we take a look at the graph here, I'm sure you guys all know the x squared graph. It looks like this. So, let's pick x equals 3. Then we get this value, which we'll call 9. What injective says or what a one-to-one -one function says, is that 
no other point or no other x value except for 3 should give you 9. But when we go over here and we take a look at x is equal to negative 3, that also gives us 9. But that means that negative 3 and 3 should be the same point, which we know it's not true. Therefore, x squared is not going to be injective. So that's injective functions. Surjective functions, or onto functions, state something a little bit different. Here, we have f going from x to y. So f is surjective if, for all y, there is some element x where f of x is equal to y. So what this just means is that the codomain is equal to the range. So for all possible values of y, there is some x that gives you y. So for instance, this y1 might map onto x, sorry, this should be the other way. So x1 will give you y1, x2 will give you y2, but let's say there's nothing for y3. Let's say we can never get to y3. Well, then the function's not on two because we need some element x3 that gives you y3. So that's how we know a function is on two when everything in y has some element x that you can get to y. So how do we do this? Well, let's show that f of x equal to 5x plus 2 is surjective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's let y is equal to f of x, and we'll just work with y here. So y is equal to 5x plus 2. Now we want to solve this equation in terms of x. So we have y minus 2 is equal to 5x. So y minus 2 over 5 is equal to x. So now that we have this equation in terms of x equaling whatever, we can now check values of y and make sure there's a corresponding x. So I'm saying, OK, we want to check if it's rejected for the real numbers. So if we pick y is equal to 0, then that means that x is equal to negative 2 over 5. OK, if y is equal to 1, then x is going to be equal to negative 1 over 5. So if f maps from the reals to the reals, then yes, this is surjective because all of our y values are rational, all of our x values are rational, so we're good. But what about if we map f from the integers to the integers? Well, we've seen here that if y is equal to 7, then x is equal to 1, so that's good. We can get 7, but can we get 5? Well, if y is equal to 5, then that means that x is going to be equal to 3 fifths, but this 3 fifths is not in the integers. So we can't get y is equal to 5 from the set of integers, which means that this y equal to 5 is not in the range. And if it's not in the range, then it can't be a surjective function. So this function here is surjective dependent on which set of numbers we're mapping to and from. So what we could do is offer an even trickier question. So let's say we have f mapping from the set of real numbers to the set of integers. So what this means now is that y is only going to be integers. But these x values here, they can be any real number. So is this function surjective? And the answer is going to be yes, it is surjective because all of these x values that get y equal to some integer, they are going to be fractions, rational fractions. So we're good. So when you take a look at surjective functions, you have to consider your range, 
your codomain, your domain, and you need to see, okay, what set of numbers are these values coming from? Because that's very crucial. When we do bijective functions, um, all we mean is that they're injective and surjective. So you take a function, f of x, and you say, okay, I need to prove it's injective and I need to prove it's surjective. And when you do both, it is bijective. So what does bijective mean? Well, it means for f going from x to y, each x maps to exactly one unique y. So, for instance, we can get a nice map like this, where all x's go to all y's, and that's okay. What this means is that you can't get, let's say, if we have three things here, we cannot get one of our x's or two of our x's going to the same y value. So if we have x1 and x3, they cannot go to the same value. They all have to go to exactly one unique value. And because it's also surjective, all of the values in y have to be used. So all of these values here have to be used. And that means each of them go to exactly one in the domain and because in a function we have to use all the values in the domain that means that the domain is also all used so what does this mean about the size of x and y well all this means is that the size of x or the size of our domain is equal to the size of the codomain so if this isn't true then we can't have a bijective function we can have a bijective partial function but we can't have a bijective function. So this is a very good test to see if you even have a function in the first place, but that's a little bit more intro to analysis sort of thing as opposed to a discrete math one course. So the cardinalities should be the same. Okay, so we've talked about bijections, injections, surjections. We should probably talk about inverses because inverses are related directly to bijective functions. So if f ma maps from x to y, the inverse maps from y to x. So what this means is that if we have an x1 value and it takes our function f to y1, then we can just go backwards and take the inverse of f to get it back. So when we say that f of x is equal to y, we also get that f inverse of y is equal to x. So sometimes you'll get a question on an exam that says, find the inverse of, let's say, f of x is equal, we'll do the same question, 5x plus 2. Then what you have to do, and in discrete math, this is a little bit tricky, because here we say inverse. If it does not tell you that f of x is equal to 5x plus 2 is a bijection, then we have a problem. Because, well, an inverse, this implies something. This implies that the function is bijective, which means that you have to prove that it's injective, and you have to prove that it's surjective. Now, luckily, when you ask for an inverse, when you prove that a function is surjective, you always get the inverse. So luckily, you get a quick solution to finding an inverse because it's already part of your proof. In fact, on my second midterm, trevtutor.com, discrete math one section midterm two, there is a question where you have to find a bijection. So uh, you will ultimately end up getting the inverse as well, even though I don't ask for it. So here's a question. Let's say I have f of f inverse of y. And I have f of x is equal to y and f inverse of y is equal to x. What does this function evaluate to? Well, so we have f and this f inverse of y is equal to x. So then we get f of x, and f of x is equal to y. So f of f inverse of y is just equal to y. 
And we know this should be true because when we take a look here, we first take y1, we map it over to x1, and then we take f back and we get to y. So when you take the inverse and then, or sorry, when, when you take just the function f and then you invert it, you just get back to where you started. So what we have here is kind of like a, a cycle. We'll call it a cycle. This is informal. So I'll write that informal. I'll put cycle in quotation marks. It's just a good way to remember it. That f of f inverse, they cancel each other out. It's kind of like saying three times one third of a variable x, where you take an x value, you multiply by a third, and then you multiply by three, and you just get this equal to x. Sort of like doing the same thing. In fact, consider this your f, and consider this your f inverse. And uh, surprise, surprise, this is actually an f, f inverse x question. Like, these are actual functions. f of x is just equal to 3x, and f inverse of x, or f inverse of y, is just equal to 1 third x. So, that's a nice way of doing it. Sorry, this should be 1 third y. Okay, so, that was inverses, bijections, injections, and surjections. Like I mentioned before, there is a midterm 2 at trivtutor.com. If you check out the discrete math 1 section, midterm 2, there are some questions there. There's also a final, which covers a lot of other material, so you can check that out there. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below, or you can go to reddit.com slash r slash trevtutor. There's a nice little community there where I answer questions other people can answer too, and it's archived, so you'll get to see everything anyone has ever asked in a nice little location. So if you enjoyed the video, share it with your friends. Um, if not, leave constructive criticism below, and I hope you guys have a great day.